but he just he didn't he had a disdain for secrecy and secret societies you know like that there was a lot of these like skull and bones type things that like george w bush was in or herbert walker bush rather his dad was george gw in skull and bones too they both were yeah yeah i mean all that whack like what are you doing you 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 dressing up like a druid what are you doing are you you burning an effigy you know a lot of people thought that was all fake Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses, which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. Their prestige and importance have largely evaporated, but the rituals are still a secret. And so when we heard that some enterprising characters had managed to spy on the famous Skull and Bone Society, well, we couldn't resist. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. New York Observer investigative reporter Ron Rosenbaum accompanied a team of Yale students who shot these pictures nine days ago. The group's heavily fortified home. From their perch, Rosenbaum and his cohorts taped the tomb's courtyard. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull, then members performing a mock killing. Even though it may seem silly to us, it seems to mean something to them, and you can't argue with the success of Skull and Bones. True. Famous alums include senators, John Kerry and John Chafee, to name two, cabinet secretaries, such as Averill Harriman, and three presidents, William Taft, George Bush, and George W. Bush, who's been reluctant to talk about Skull and Bones. Does it still exist? I mean, the thing is so secret that I'm not even sure it still exists. She was part of a team that successfully recorded part of the initiation ceremony that takes place in the tomb's courtyard. Okay, you have the doorway here. Yeah. Okay, then to the right, you have a hedge, and yeah. then you have um, an evergreen tree. If you follow yeah. that line straight back, the courtyard's in there. Ah, okay. so, so that's where they have the ceremonies in the outdoor place. part of it. Part of it was indoor, so we only got to see the outdoor part. Right. We only got to and, and to listen to the outdoor part. God only knows what went on indoors. And what did you hear? What What was it? You know, you managed to get this unique. Oh, it was disgusting. It. it was gross. I mean, they were pretending to murder people. And what was the tone of it though? Was it Was it jokey vicious. or was it quite? No, it wasn't jokey at all. It was It was sick. It's about the only way to describe it. It was sick. What you're hearing is the first recording ever made of the Skull and Bones initiation ceremony. It has never been broadcast before. Fifteen new members of the club are being introduced into the macabre rituals of Skull and Bones by the senior students who are about to graduate. The club has what some might see as a strange fascination with death, skulls and bones. There's the chance too, difficult to hear first of all, but including the devil equals death and death equals death. Skull and bones is so tiny, that's what makes this staggering. There are, there are only 15 people a year, which means there are about 800 living members at any one time. We know that a lot of bonesmen have gone on to positions of great power. That's what Skull and Bones' purpose is, to get as many members as possible into positions of power. Though there is this mythology about Skull and Bones running, pulling the strings of government, you're saying the fact is Skull and Bones are pulling the strings of government. They do have many individuals in influential positions and that's why this is something that we need to know about. I don't believe that um, people who represent our country, especially the President of the United States, should be allowed to have an allegiance to a secret organization. You were both in Skull and Bone, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the website. Number 322? <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. 
Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? A secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job, and I intend to do it. And we'll be watching Be Safe on the Campaign Trail. John Kerry, thanks yes, for joining us. And we'll be right back. I know it was. He was talking about it. He was talking about it on the podcast about, you know, like that they couldn't believe what they found. So this is this place, Bohemian Grove. And the idea was that uh, all the elites would go there and they would engage in these occult rituals. This is in America? Yeah. Yeah, it's in California. Oh. It's like Northern California. And so you hear about this and you're like, what? Like, if you heard about that, like, hey, there's a place. <clears throat> Former presidents go, top top ranking generals and heads of state and bankers and famous artists. They go to this place and they they do occult rituals. Yeah. They perform occult rituals. So he went and snuck in to this place where like former presidents go. There's yeah. a photograph of it's uh, Ronald Reagan with Herbert Walker Bush and a couple other people all standing around. And it's like, these are the people that used to hang out at this place, and they would put on robes, and they would worship an owl god, an owl god and they would burn an effigy. And they're playing, and, and Alex snuck in and made video footage of and then no one's denying that it's real. This really did happen. They're, so they're in with these bankers and former presidents, and they're dressed like druids, yes. and, they, and some guy brings over something that it's an effigy that's supposed to be a body, a wrapped up effigy, it's also a bunch of sticks in, bl in a blanket, but it's like shaped like a body, yeah. and then they drop it on the fire, and they're all worshipping an owl god. Hundreds of protesters will clash this Saturday with prominent national figures as they arrive for their exclusive all-male bohemian summer camp escape. Channel 50's Susan Maddox has this report. As the nation's power brokers continue to filter in for their high-priced summer camp out at the Bohemian Grove, they'll once again be met by angry protesters. And to make the point to the American public that the real decision-making that happens in this country does not happen through our elected representatives. It happens through a, uh, an established good old boys network, uh, what a lot of us refer to as uh, the ruling class. It happens, uh, the real decisions that get made in this country are not necessarily in Congress. They are usually behind closed doors. Bohemian Grove just happens to be a prime example of one of many places that these men get together without public scrutiny. America's greatest enemies are not attacking us from abroad, but are working systematically from within our own jurisdictions to overthrow the sovereignty of Americans. Secret societies have infiltrated the highest levels of the United States government, and our country is in more danger today than it has ever been. These secret terrorists are making decisions and enacting policies that are causing great harm to Americans, and they do so with impunity. They are neither Republican or Democrat and have used both sides of the political spheres to bring in their destructive methods of government. And their strategy to polarize citizens against each other is thriving. America was a revolutionary idea to have a nation by the people and for the people, something that had never been tried in history before. But like many other things meant to be good, Evil men have found a way to abuse our system and undermine our principles. They are enforcing schemes that were designed behind closed doors in secret meetings to bring about a one-world political system. They are methodically trying to dismantle the family unit, abolish private property, destroy our currency, and want to eliminate our national borders, among other things, to bring their plans to fruition. Unfortunately, their techniques are successful and some Americans who are indoctrinated by mainstream media even cheer them on as they decimate our country. To truly understand why this is happening, we must realize the spiritual aspects behind the attacks and why America's founding Protestant principles are considered a threat to their new world order. Secret societies and pagan rituals have been with us since the dawn of humankind. Often when people hear of stuff like this, our first natural reaction is skepticism. Like Joe Rogan said, it's hard to believe that world leaders are out in the woods performing mock human sacrifices to a giant owl statue. But you must realize this has been going on for thousands of years and is traced back to the ancient early Babylonian civilizations. These heathen rituals for the gods are strictly forbidden in the Bible because these pagan gods are Satan and his fallen angels. 
We have an abundance of evidence these satanic rituals are being practiced by some of the most influential people in the world. The Bible explains that these individuals practice these rituals to gain a spiritual advantage over other people. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, Satan appeared as an angel of light and told Jesus if he would fall down and worship him, Satan would give him all the kingdoms of this world. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The Bible is clear that Satan is the god of this world, and he's also called the prince of the power of the air. Satan desires worship and wants to put himself in the place of God. Isaiah 14 says he wants to be like the Most High. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The reason the powerful leaders are performing occult rituals is because this is considered worship to Satan. In return, the devil gives them the kingdoms and riches he has control over. He says, I want power. I go right to the source of power. And he says, how do you think that I became famous the way that I am? Well, I said, you must have had some good luck. Well, he says, there's no such thing as good luck. He says, there's either some power working for you somewhere or you don't get ahead in this world. Not in my, my type of occupation. So, um, it, it went from there that we went, to, we got talking about uh, spirit worship. He said, the, the supposed spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits. You're fallen angels. They're beautiful beings. Just set it out, just like Oh, that. yeah. It didn't make you uneasy when he said they were Well, you know, it shocked you a little bit, you know. Something that you first hear uh, uh, mentioned to you. He said, uh, you guys have got a great future ahead of you. Because we've been told, the high priest of our society, secret society, has been told that the master has very special plans for you too. Now, what did he mean by the master? Uh, Satan. In the last episode, we saw clips from an interview with Roger Murnau. Roger was recruited by a very rich, powerful secret society of demon worshippers in 1946. He went to several occult ceremonies where he spoke with a satanic high priest who revealed many important details to Roger, believing Roger would join the cult and keep the secrets. We also discussed the UFO phenomenon and how Roger said the secret societies will use this deception to help bring in the New World Order. And uh, then he said, uh, could I have a little bit more of your time? I want to do something very fascinating. He says, the grain plain, the master's grain plain, for harvesting the nations, uh, for, for harvesting the multitudes of the earth into his cause, just before the close of the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. So he continued, you know, after we uh, express ourselves, that we're deeply interested to know more about the activities of spirits. And he said, it's going to be done in a unique manner. This, this grain plan is, is, is going to take people, people are going to eat the stuff. Because it says, spirits, demon spirits, will declare themselves to be inhabitants of far distant planets in the galaxies. That are coming to warn the inhabitants of planet Earth of the impending destruction of the planet. Unless something seriously proper is done to avoid it. Roger wrote two books about his involvement with secret societies, A Trip into the Supernatural and Charmed by Darkness. Not everyone who belongs to these secret organizations knows what Roger is revealing. Roger had a unique experience where he was involved with a special elite group. Satan and other fallen angels would appear during their ceremonies and give the members instructions. The book of Revelation gives us a glimpse 
of the war that started before man was created. Satan deceived one-third of the angels to join a rebellion against God, and for doing so they were kicked out of heaven. God confined them to the earth. The purpose of these secret societies is to worship these fallen angels. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We worship spirits. We worship Lucifer, the, Lucifer and all his angels. They're just as beautiful as they did before they were cast out of heaven. He says there was a misunderstanding in the whole thing, he says, in the, among the inhabitants of the galaxies. And he says our master was misunderstood, and God did not bear with him like he does with, with people that make mistakes today. So we're in a warfare, good against evil. And we happen to be the evil ones, but we're not that bad. He says, I look at this business between the forces of good and evil. He says, you believe in, in uh, one person believe in God, and everyone believes in Lucifer. It's like politics. Most people think this is just conspiracy theories because they say no one could keep secrets like these. But Roger explains that each person is chosen by the spirits. They are shown that the spirits see everything and they will be killed if they reveal something about the society. Because the, the high priest said that the, the master had special plans for us in our lives and that no one ever went into the society unless they were invited by the spirits. See, so that was made very clear. And he also expressed to us the danger, explained to us the danger of uh, uh, going against the will of the spirits. And he mentioned about this one uh, man and his wife that live in a fireproof building in Montreal. The place burned right down with him in it. Mm. He was one of their members that had decided that, well, he wanted to think things over. He, he was not going to get initiated at a time that the spirit said he would like him to be initiated in the, into the society. So in reality, Roger, you were chosen mm -hmm. by high-powered demon spirits yeah. to be a part of their human special privileged mm -hmm. group. You see, these people in Montreal, the society, uh, like the priest mentioned, there's thousands of spirit worshippers in only different societies of spirit worshippers in this world. But he says, we are the elite. We know the real truth about the Master and his angels. And they are not idiots looking beings. They are gorgeous creatures. Roger just explained that the members are being watched by spirits which are fallen angels. These fallen angels are extremely powerful and have supernatural abilities beyond what we can understand. Satan is not omnipresent like God, but he does have unique talents to see things going on around the world and has fallen angels recording events. This is why Satan uses the symbol of the all-seeing eye to remind the members he is watching everything. He is the prince of the power of the air according to the Bible. These fallen angels can shapeshift into any form including animals and humans. They can cause humans to see very vivid visions and dreams. The Bible describes their appearances as bright illuminated beings. The Roman soldiers that were sent to guard the tomb of Jesus fell as dead men because of the manifestation of one angel. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. It's impossible to cover all the secret societies in one video. But I want to reveal which organization is pulling the strings behind the scenes. What sounds outlandish and like conspiracy theories to some is Roger said in his interview that Satan is working with a few select people in occult societies that Lucifer has put in strategic positions of power around the world to help bring in this new world order, or what some are calling the Great Reset. The people in the secret societies think this new age will bring about a utopian era of peace on earth. But in reality, it will bring about an Orwellian style government that persecutes its people. The book of Revelation warns us of a one world government and one world religion in the last days that will be established 
because these fallen angels will reveal themselves to humanity. To understand the secret war that is being inflicted on America, we must know where it is coming from and why. In Johnny Cerucci's book, Illuminati Unmasked, he says, Who has enough influence to infiltrate and control the most powerful intelligence agencies and financial institutions in the world? For surely that is where power resides. Cerucci is pointing out, whoever is controlling all these institutions must be very wealthy and powerful. To answer that question, we have to examine some history of the secret societies and who were they originally working for. One of the most powerful societies in history was the Knights of the Templar, formed around 1118 AD. They were a very wealthy Catholic secret society and for a time was headquartered on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, thus giving them the name Knights of the Templar. Movies and media often portray them as noble skilled fighters during the Crusades, but forget to mention the inner core elite group of the Templars were practicing the occult religion of Kabbalah and Gnosticism. They were very much seeking esoteric knowledge and practicing black magic. To the outside world and new initiates, they seemed to be practicing Catholicism. So this is one of the early secret societies who portrayed themselves as Catholic, but in reality they were controlled by Luciferians. On Friday, October the 13th, 1307, the King of France, Philip Le Bel, brought charges against the Knights of the Templar and its Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. Ever since, Friday the 13th has been considered a day of bad luck around the world. The allegations brought against them had to do with their initiation ceremonies and other occult practices. In occult author Nesta Webster's book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, she says, the charges brought against them was about the ceremony of initiation into their order was accompanied by insults to the cross, the denial of Christ, and gross obscenities. She then adds, the adoration of an idol which was said to be the image of the true God. Later in her book, she reveals the idol they were taught to worship was the bearded head known to history as Baphomet, which is very popular today among Luciferians. We often see it in Hollywood and very prominent in the music industry with certain artists. The Catholic Church always portrays the Templars as courageous Christian warriors, but nothing could be further from the truth. During their trial, many of the men confessed to spitting on the cross and worshiping Baphomet. In Webster's book, she says, To all these infamies, a great number of the knights, including Jacques de Molay, confessed in almost precisely the same terms. At their admission into the order, they said that they had been shown the cross on which was the figure of Christ, and had been asked whether they believed in him. When they answered yes, they were told in some cases that this was wrong, because he was not God, he was a false prophet. Some added that they were shown an idol or a bearded head which they were told to worship. One Templar added that this was of such terrible aspect that it seemed to him to be the face of some devil, and that whenever he saw it, he was so overcome with fear that he could hardly look at it without fear and trembling. Some said that on their refusal to carry out these orders, they had been threatened with imprisonment. Webster also explains how the Templar soldiers were forced to practice obscenities and unnatural vice, which means strange sexual acts. The Knights of the Templars was a very rich organization. In Jim Marr's book, The Illuminati, he says, although the conventional history traces the development of modern banking to early Jewish and Italian lending institutions, it was the Knights of the Templars who predated the famous Rothschilds. They also collected papal taxes, tithes, and donations for the church, as well as taxes and revenues for the English king. Jim Mars also points out in his book that the Templars built many of the Gothic cathedrals and says, It's interesting to note that at the time the Templars built their first Gothic cathedrals, not one carried a depiction of the crucifixion, a most strange anomaly for a Christian order but strong evidence that the Templars indeed denied the orthodoxy of the church. Occult author Nesta Webster said in her book, The Templars had combined secrecy and occult rites with political aim of domination. We shall find this double tradition running through all secret society movements up to present day. Webster, the prolific occult author, says, All secret societies have two objectives, and that is occult knowledge and political influence. On March 22nd in 1312, at the Council of Vienne, the Knights of the Templar were reluctantly abolished by papal decree, 
because their occult activities had been revealed to the public and people were shocked when they heard the horrific atrocities being practiced by the Templars. The papacy defended the order as long as possible, but after so many people had become aware of these satanic ceremonies, they felt they must condemn the Templars to save face. Also, certain kings were worried about how powerful the organization had become. But the esoteric knowledge remained alive, and the order reappears under different names with the same ideology. Some of those modern occult societies that rose out of the Templars was the Rosicrucians and Freemasons. In Jim Mar's book, Illuminati, he says, By 1750, the previous distinctions between Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and other organizations that claimed Templar origins had blurred to the point that they all appeared virtually the same. Mars was pointing out that all these secret societies appeared to have the same principles and political aims, but just using different names. Mars also quotes a British historian, Lawrence Gardner, who said, The Templars indeed survived by going underground and fusing with other secret societies, specifically the Rosicrucians and Freemasons. These days, history books and encyclopedias are almost unanimous in declaring that the Knights of the Templar became extinct in the 1300s, but they are quite wrong. Mars also says in his book, Rosicrucians were seen by the church as Satanists and accused of making compacts with the devil and sacrificing children. The most important part that I'm trying to highlight and that I want you to notice is all these secret societies had ties to the Catholic Church and they were started by prominent members of Catholic clergy. The next secret society that arises out of the Catholic Church becomes the most powerful and intrusive force the world has ever seen. Named the Society of Jesus, are also called the Jesuits. In Jim Mar's book, The Illuminati, he writes, Another order created specifically to combat the Vatican's enemies and to protect the secrets of the Church was the Jesuits. This order, officially known as the Society of Jesus, was formed in 1540 by Ignatius Loyola, a soldier-turned-priest who swiftly turned the organization into an aggressive militant force against both heretics and Protestants alike. It was the structure of the Jesuits that Adam Weishaupt used as a template for his Illuminati. The Jesuits is the most powerful secret society that has ever existed, and renowned for trickery, cruelty, and disturbance. When we talk about the Jesuits, we're not talking about your neighborhood priest. Don't let the name of the order fool you. Many historians have noticed the similarities between the Jesuits and the Knights of the Templar. Just like the Knights of the Templar, they have an inner core group that is practicing occult mysticism. But to the rest of the world, they give the appearance of a charitable Catholic Christian order. Beware the false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Ignatius of Loyola, who started the Jesuits, has been described by many historians who studied his writings as being a mystic, meaning he was into occult mysticism. He was also suspected of being in another secret society called the Alumbrados, which means illuminated and is thought to be the precursor to the Illuminati. In Jim Mar's book, he writes, The name Illuminati means enlightened ones and usually refers to a person who has been enlightened or illuminated by receiving knowledge from a higher or esoteric source. Some believe this name came from a small group of Gnostics in Spain called the Alumbrados, meaning illuminated. It was founded by a Spanish Jesuit, Ignatius of Loyola. The Alumbrados taught a form of Gnosticism. Now, of course, the Catholic Church tries to hide any information about this and claims Ignatius was a devout Christian. But we also know Ignatius was arrested three times by the Catholic Church before he started the Jesuit order for practicing and teaching mysticism. The Gnosticism that Ignatius taught, it mixed Christian themes with pagan religions. In short, they were Luciferians and their goal was to corrupt Christian teachings. Ignatius accomplished this goal by infiltrating the Catholic Church and creating the Jesuit order. What better way to deceive Christians than calling your occult organization the Society of Jesus? In the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, it says, In April 1527, the Inquisitions put Ignatius in prison to try him on the grounds of heresy. 
released but forbidden to hold meetings, Ignatius left and soon started the same activities. Similar suspicions amongst the inquisitors led to imprisonment again. His efforts to indoctrinate his fellow students, according to his peculiar methods, brought him into trouble again with the Inquisition. From the start, medieval mysticism has prevailed in the society of Jesus. The origins and conditions for establishing the Jesuits are crucial for understanding its intentions. Ignatius Loyola started the Jesuits with six other men in 1534 and was later approved by the Pope in 1540. Their sole purpose was to combat the Protestant Reformation, which officially started in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church doors in Wittenberg, Germany. This pivotal turning point in history challenged the authority of the Catholic papacy. Around the same time the printing press was invented, making Bibles available to the common people in their own language. For centuries the Catholic papacy outlawed the Bible and kept it only in Latin, a language only the clergy understood. William Tyndale was the first to translate the original Hebrew and Greek into English. When the King James was created, much of Tyndale's translations were used in that Bible a hundred years later. The Catholic Church charged Tyndale with heresy in 1536. He was strangled and burned at the stake. Four years later, the Jesuits were officially created to combat the Protestant Reformation and stamp out people like William Tyndale and Martin Luther. William Tyndale and Martin Luther were both Catholic clergy who protested the church because they wanted to remove the impurities and the corruption. The church had become so corrupted, it no longer resembled the original Christian faith started by Jesus and the apostles. And now the people had Bibles in their own language, they could see for themselves the misrepresentation. Not only could they see the church extorted money from the people, but also noticed all the similarities between the Catholic Pope and the persecuting Antichrist system of the Bible. Martin Luther wrote, and I quote, I'm practically cornered and can hardly doubt any more that the Pope is really the Antichrist, because everything so exactly corresponds to the way of his life, actions, words, and commandments. Luther also said, We here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Personally, I declare that I owe the Pope no other obedience than that to Antichrist. Further, he said, I already feel greater liberty in my heart, for at last I know that the Pope is the Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. William Tyndale said when speaking about the papal office, It is impossible to preach Christ except thou preach against Antichrist. He also said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life many years, I will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than he does. Another reformer, John Calvin, said, Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church, stated in his writings over a hundred times the Pope was Antichrist. He said, He is an emphatical sense the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is, too, properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. He also said, Yea, we doubt not to prove the kingdom of the Pope to be the kingdom and power of Antichrist. Another reformer, John Knox, said, That tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church, he is the very Antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. An early reformer, John Huss, said, As for the Antichrist occupying the papal chair, it is evident that a pope living contrary to Christ, like any other perverted person, is called by common consent Antichrist. Famous Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, Then the world changed its tactics, it became nominally Christian, and Antichrist came forth in all its blasphemous glory. The Pope of Rome put on the triple crown and called himself the Vicar of Christ. Then came in the abomination of the worship of saints, angels, images, and pictures. He further said, It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the Popery and the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. 
I could give hours upon hours of quotes from well-known theologians of all denominations, including Catholics, who proclaim publicly that the office of the Pope is that of Antichrist. That gives us a good idea of the Protestant culture during the years the Jesuits were established. The Catholic Church explicitly created the Jesuits to stop the Protestant movement that was sweeping the world. The Jesuits wanted to bring everyone back under the authority of the Pope, and like other secret societies, they set their eyes on world domination. This became known as the Counter-Reformation. And this is not a conspiracy theory, this is very well recorded in history. Many think the Jesuits are an innocent religious order, but they are really the Templars under a different name. Napoleon said this about the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is the general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotism and at the same time, the greatest and most enormous of abuses. I'm highlighting this point that the Jesuits are a military organization because we are still seeing the war today being played out in America. Many of the Protestants came to America fleeing the persecution that came from the Catholic Church and seeking religious freedom. When America was founded, it was built on Protestant concepts. Our Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Bill of Rights were established on the foundation of Protestant biblical principles. These freedoms are contrary to the way the Catholic Church operates. In Bill Hughes' book, America's Secret Terrorist, he says, Jesuits would be the chief tool of Rome to undo and destroy every trace of Protestantism wherever it was found. America's two greatest documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, are filled with Protestant declarations that are absolutely intolerable to the Jesuits of Rome. Does it surprise you that the Vatican condemns the founding documents of the United States? Another author, Avro Manhattan, who wrote many books on Vatican politics said, The Vatican condemned the Declaration of Independence as wickedness and called the Constitution of the United States a satanic document. Roman Catholic Lafayette gave a stern warning to the U.S. and said, It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars in Europe. In a letter Abraham Lincoln wrote to Charles Chiniqui, who was an ex-Catholic priest, he expressed clearly that the civil war in the United States was caused by the Jesuits of Rome. He said, and I quote, Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against the Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits. There are only very few of the southern leaders who are not more or less under the influence of the Jesuits. But it is certain that if the American people could learn what I know of the fierce hatred of the priests of Rome against our institutions, our schools, our most sacred rights, and our so dearly bought liberties, they would drive them away tomorrow from among us, or they would shoot them as traitors. This war would have never been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. Catholic priest Charles Chiniqui was a good friend of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, because Lincoln defended him as his attorney where he had been falsely accused of misconduct. A Catholic bishop set Charles up because he was speaking out against alcohol being used by Catholic priests, so they attacked his character, trying to destroy his reputation. No attorney wanted the case because they knew they were fighting the Jesuits of Rome. But before he was president, Abraham Lincoln took the case and won by exposing their lies. Father Chiniqui wrote a book about the experience and published the letters that he and Lincoln wrote to each other. He said this to Lincoln after they won the case. Abraham Lincoln said, What are you crying for? Father Chiniqui answered, Dear Mr. Lincoln, allow me to tell you that the joy I should naturally feel for such a victory is destroyed in my mind 
by the fear of what it may cost you. There were in the court not less than 10 or 12 Jesuits from Chicago and St. Louis who came to hear my sentence of condemnation to the penitentiary. What troubles my soul just now and draws my tears is that it seems to me that I have read your sentence of death in their fiendish eyes. Four years later in 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president to the United States, he had to pass through Baltimore on his way to Washington, D.C., and wrote a letter to his good friend Charles about the attempt on his life by the Jesuits. He said this, I am so glad to meet you again. You see that your friends the Jesuits have not yet killed me, but they would have surely done it when I passed through their most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not passed by incognito a few hours before they expected me. We have proof that the company which had been selected and organized to murder me was led by a rabid Roman Catholic. In another letter Abraham Lincoln wrote, it said, So many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed when we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of the skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by the Jesuits. Father Chinicky said this in his book after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. But who was that assassin? Booth was nothing but a tool of the Jesuits. It was Rome who directed his arm after corrupting his heart and damning his soul. No man of common sense who knows anything about the priests of Rome can doubt that they were the advisors, the counselors, the very soul of that infernal plot. Those priests were the personal friends and the father confessors of John Wilkes Booth. One of the other conspirators in Lincoln's assassination was John Surratt, who fled America to escape capture. It's very interesting where U.S. officials finally found him, as Bill Hughes writes in his book, The Secret Terrorist. He says, Right after Lincoln's death, John Surratt, who was part of the assassination conspiracy, fled to Montreal. From Montreal, he was taken to Liverpool, England, and then to Rome. When a United States official finally caught up with him, he was found in the Pope's personal army. A conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a member of the Pope's personal army." It's interesting, I don't remember hearing this information in history class that the Vatican was really behind the plot to kill our 16th president. More disturbing is Abraham Lincoln was not the only president killed by the Jesuits in the Vatican. Many books have been written on how they have removed kings, queens, and any politicians who might disagree with them. In fact, the Jesuits even poisoned their own pope. Pope Clement XIV abolished the Jesuit order in 1773. A year later, he was poisoned and said this as he died in agonizing pain. Alas, I knew the Jesuits would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner." They have a reputation for removing anyone who stands in their way or rejects their authority. Some historians believe they were also behind the plot to assassinate JFK and would be the only ones to have the means to pull off such a conspiracy. In 2017, a Gallup poll stated that 61% of Americans do not believe JFK was killed by a lone gunman, that anyone who examines the evidence will come to a different conclusion than the Warren Commission. We will cover this topic in the sequels to this episode. To understand the Jesuits' hatred towards Protestants and their mission to destroy America, one only needs to read part of their secret oath, and I quote, I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever. Even as a corpse or a cadaver will I unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope. I furthermore promise and declare that I will when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up their stomachs and the wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of a person or persons, 
whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus." End quote. And I see that there's a lot of liberal symbols here. Um, one of the things in your, in your Jesuit high oath, I think it is, it says something about Furthermore, you promise to declare that we'll, at the first opportunity, um, seek war at any opportunity against heretics, Protestants, liberals. What is that? See here, and that that uh, you will spare neither age nor sex nor condition, what, what, what and I will hang, yeah, waste, I, boil, flay. You've never seen that. this before. No, I've never seen it. Strangle, bury alive. Oh, and it's horrible. It's and I was like, no, look, me it's. Just have it's in the congressional record. Thank you very much. To think that a person would agree with such an abominable oath defies reason. One could not even imagine a more despicable oath by a supposed Christian order. The word heretic in their oath means anyone who disagrees with the Pope or rejects his authority. According to their own words, this gives them the right to kill anyone they see fit without mercy and they are taught they will be justified by God for doing so. I'm going to suggest that the Jesuits have been causing problems in America since its founding documents were written. Many people, including past presidents, have recognized our most dangerous enemies are ones working in secret to destroy our Constitution. John Adams, second president and founding father of America, wrote many letters warning another founding father and third president Thomas Jefferson about the Jesuits. Here's a short excerpt revealing his concerns, and I quote, I do not like the late resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than everybody knows. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only the kings of the gypsies can know? Dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is the society of Loyola's, the Jesuits. As the Jesuits' reputation became the name of terror, they set up other secret societies and started working under different names so their hideous crimes would not be traced back to the Catholic Church. They established other secret societies to do their dirty work for them. One of the occult organizations was the infamous Illuminati, founded by a Jesuit named Adam Weishaupt in 1776. Professor and Jesuit Adam Weishaupt boasted of his organization's secrecy. He realized that this secrecy would enable them to decide the fate of nations, and because their deliberations were secret, no outsider could interfere. He wrote, The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. You see, because every history book that you read tells you that the Illuminati went out of existence immediately after its, its uh, being discovered by the government of Bavaria. And it was interesting, by the way, the way they discovered the Illuminati was totally secret. And in those days, you didn't have mail service like we have today. You know, we just stick the mail in the slot and we know somebody's going to come along and pick it up and, and in Timbuktu, they're going to get my letter, right? Well, this isn't the way it was back in the, in the 1700s. Particularly if you had uh, really confidential correspondence, you hired a messenger or someone, some friend, some family member, someone you bought, bought went out and delivered your package, your letter, correspondence, documents, whatever it was. And they had this Illuminist carrying these documents between key leaders in the Illuminati. Guess what? As he was approaching Ingolstadt University, lo and behold, a bolt of lightning came down and killed him on, this, on his horse. It was an act of God. And when the authorities got there and opened up the papers that he had on them, they said, wait, wait a minute, what is this? These people are talking about taking over governments and killing people and developing poisons to, and, and all of that sort of thing. What, what is this all about? So they found the, some of the members because of these papers and started to interrogate them. And they discovered what the goals of the Illuminati were. Author and theologian Bill Hughes said, 
Jesuit Adam Weishaupt established the modern version of the Illuminati specifically to be a front organization behind which the Jesuits could hide. After being formally abolished by Pope Clement in 1773, the Jesuits used the Illuminati and other organizations to carry out their operations. Thus, the front organizations would be blamed for the trouble caused by the Jesuits. The fact that it was a Jesuit who started the Illuminati and its methods and goals for world domination were virtually the same is very telling. Many historians have recognized that the Jesuits were pulling the strings of this secret society and many others. The Jesuits were simply just operating under different names. The Protestant Reformation had fingered the Pope as the Antichrist, so anything the Jesuits or the Pope did was alarming to Protestants, so they changed their name of operation. Just as Adam Weishaupt said, let it never appear in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. But the goals of these occult societies are all the same. In the beginning of the video, we played news clips of the Skull and Bones Secret Society, followed by Bohemian Grove clips. In Anthony Sutton's book, America's Secret Establishment, an introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones, he draws a connection between members of the Illuminati and the Skull and Bones Society. He also points out the rituals and the methods of the two orders are very similar, and then the fact that they are both German orders. He says the Bohemian Grove is the outer layer of the Skull and Bones and is most likely used to recruit other politicians. What is even more interesting is in the Skull and Bones initiation ceremony, they have someone dressed in papal vestments, teaching that the Pope is a figure of authority. During the Bohemian Grove rituals, they also have someone dressed in papal vestments. Ron Rosenbaum, a Yale student who investigated Skull and Bones and got a recording of their initiation ceremony, which we heard at the beginning of the video, where they were performing mock human sacrifices, he said, I do seem to have come across definite, if skeletal, links between the origins of bones, rituals, and those of the notorious barbarian Illuminists. Jim Mars says in his book, Other researchers agree that the Skull and Bones order is merely the Illuminati in disguise, since Masonic emblems, symbols, the German slogan, even the layout of their initiation room are all identical to those found in Masonic lodges in Germany, associated with the Illuminati. Another popular order the Jesuits like to use is the Freemasons. Now your average neighborhood Freemason has no clue what he's actually involved with. It's only the highest degrees that understands this. American historian James Parton said, if you trace up masonry through all its orders till you come to the grand tip-top head mason of the world, you will discover that the dreaded individual and the chief of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, are one in the same person. In Jim Marr's book, he says, In just 11 short years of existence, the Illuminati not only infiltrated nearly all courts of the Holy Roman Empire, but also managed to penetrate the Freemasons, one of the oldest and most secretive societies in the world. Weishaupt decided the Illuminati would infiltrate Freemasonry because as a secret society, its members were bound by oath not to divulge anything they might hear or learn. It was a perfect cover for Illuminati subversion. Weishaupt blended his brand of Illuminism with Freemasonry after joining the Masonic Order's Lodge in 1777. It was a Freemason lodge where the Illuminati formulated their anti-clerical and anti-government agenda. And so society determines your form of government. Now if you change that society, you automatically change the government within a certain amount of time. It just is an automatic result. That's why immigration, mass immigration called migration, anytime that's ever happened, there's no time in history when that didn't change the society and the government into which they migrated. No exceptions. These occult orders' primary objective is to change our society. Since our founding, they have been waging a relentless secret war against the United States. As author Thompson said, if you change the culture, you automatically change the government. This technique has been practiced for thousands of years. In 2 Kings chapter 17, when Israel, the northern kingdom, was conquered by the Assyrians, the Assyrian king immediately brought in people from pagan areas to inhabit the land of Israel. 
because that would change the Jewish culture and make them more acceptable to the new form of government. Our southern border is open right now because this is a fast way to change American culture. It's a revolution. You know, we think that they want a revolution. They're going to go in the street and they're going to kill a few people and they're going to establish this new government. They know they can't establish a new government unless they change the society. Now, if they don't change the society enough, what do they do? They eliminate part of the society, like Cambodia. They took whole cities, literally cities, not little towns, not little villages, whole cities in Cambodia and marched them out into the killing fields and slaughtered them all because they knew they couldn't change that society without eliminating enough people to do it. Nepster Webster, one of the major researchers into the Illuminati, summarized the goals of the Illuminati, which is the front organization for the Jesuits. These are their goals to change the culture in any country like the United States, to make the population more acceptable to the new form of government, which is the New World Order. They know they have to break down the Judeo-Christian values in America because so many Protestants settled here. We will cover in future episodes how they have accomplished these goals. This list has been recorded by many other researchers who all agree, and this quote is from Ralph Epperson's book, The Unseen Hand. The abolition of all monarchies and all governments, the abolition of private property, the abolition of inheritance, the abolition of patriotism or nationalism, the abolition of the family and marriage and all morality and the institutions of communal education of children, the abolition of all religion. Ralph Epperson, an American historian who studied these secret societies for over 50 years, explains in his book, Unseen Hand, that the fact that people do not believe the goals of the Illuminati are real is what gives them their power. He said, It is difficult for the observer to believe that such a giant, well-organized conspiracy does exist and that the goals they envision for the world are real. This disbelief by the public is what fuels their success and it benefits the conspiracy to plan their events in such a way that the truth becomes so incredible and so preposterous that no one would believe that they are intentionally created. So today's, today's visit was not particularly fraught for President Biden, particularly because he has met with this pope. He's met with Pope Francis numerous times in the past. He even keeps a picture of one of their past meetings in the Oval Office. A lot has been made of the fact now that President Joe Biden is only the second Catholic president after JFK, and therefore he's just the second Catholic president to have an audience with the pope. That, of course, is true. But it also simplifies it too much. It fails to capture how much the world has changed since Kennedy visited the Vatican six decades ago. In a great many ways, President Biden's Catholicism is much less of a fraught political issue than when Kennedy was in office. Yes, there are definitely still those on the far right who, who question Biden's faith, who think he's not really a Catholic or there's something they should be questioning about his Catholicism. But nobody is really even debating anymore whether or not the Pope is secretly pulling the strings when it comes to how the U.S. is governed. Where is all this headed and what is the Jesuit agenda for America? The Bible is the only reliable source for these answers. For over 200 years, the goal has been the complete destruction of the United States Constitution. And this would mean an utter demise and annihilation of the precious freedoms guaranteed by that document. The right to free speech, free press, freedom of religion, the right to bear arms, the right to a fair trial, and the right to personal privacy would all be eliminated. And you are blind if you don't see those rights being assaulted in the media every day. All of these are under attack because they are contrary to the way the Catholic Church operates. The point of the New World Order is to give them back the power they had during the Dark Ages. And the Book of Revelation says they will succeed. We only scratched the surface in this video. But in upcoming episodes, we will examine how the Jesuits have been waging relentless attacks against the reliability of the Bible and how the occult created, financed, and promoted the theory of evolution to the world. We'll see how the Jesuits were behind the creation of communism, or how Hitler was supported by the Jesuits. We'll examine how these secret societies have infiltrated our most important institutions, and the impact it's had on America. But most importantly, we'll see how the Bible predicted all of this, and that we can trust God's Word. If you liked this episode, 
please subscribe to our YouTube or Rumble channel and follow us on Facebook. Also, if you want to help us reach more people, please consider donating to our ministry. Thank you so much for watching and God bless. Not only are they studying it, uh, Caroldo Balducci, who was the spokesman for the Vatican, he was their official mouthpiece concerning the alien presence, not just the reality of aliens on other worlds, but an alien presence that is here on Earth now. Is You can go to YouTube and watch his shows on Italian television when he spoke for the church and said that the church was using its embassies around the world to compile information, a case study, if you will, on what the aliens are doing on Earth now. So the belief system is deep, regardless of what you or I might make out of it. And I got to tell you, especially when it comes to aliens, and abduction, I am convinced that we are talking about demonic activity, not intelligences from another world, maybe from another dimension. And they're moving in and out of our reality. They certainly have a conspiratorial uh, plan that might even involve human hybridity. There's a lot to the study. That's why it took us thousands of pages and six investigators, and I had to bring a theologian on <laughs> to make sure that I didn't get off track, right? But, uh, but, but what they're saying to us now is it's going to affect Christian belief. There is a professor for the Pope's uh, uh, University in Rome, and uh, uh, he is a very highly respected intellectual. Uh, his last name is Tenz Niti, and he has written a paper now in which he is saying that very soon, not, a, not right in the beginning, we won't have to um, deny our Christian faith in the beginning. But there is information coming from another world, and once it is confirmed, it is going to require a rereading of the gospel as we know it. And that's the kind of information that we are receiving from the highest levels of Vatican intelligentsia. Where's this headed, in your opinion, after all this research? I think it's headed towards an imminent great deception. Uh, I, think, I think they either know something or they suspect something, and that's why they're preparing the Catholic faithful. The, 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 and, of course, the Vatican has reached beyond Catholics. Um, but they're trying to prepare the world. 